you're on show. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Shell Schwartz and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, my co-panelist today is Heidi Lurch and we both work with Safe Disability Services, um, as Michelle said, in Austin, Texas. So Safe is a dual domestic violence sexual assault center and our day-to-day -day work is focused on child abuse sexual assault, domestic violence, sex trafficking, and providing education and outreach to our community. We know that violence is often intergenerational. And so one of the things that we're striving to do is break those cycles through parenting assistance and education, and then through program like ours, disability services, and then safe expect respect and deaf share um, we are providing parenting assistance and um, healthy relationships and abuse prevention um, education in the community. In the disability services program, we're working with communities that number one, are at increased risk for abuse. And then two, community members with disabilities that historically have not gained access to domestic violence, sexual assault services, and the supports that historically community members have been able to access in victim service agencies. And so um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump in and get started. And for some reason, I'm not advancing. My slide is not advancing, just say. If you click on the screen, it will help you just kind of. Um, okay. Hmm. Well, it advanced when I tested. Let me see. Heidi, do you want to see if you can advance? Um, so, Michelle, I can't advance um, from you because you you're, you're displaying the slides. But if you click on the screen with your mouse, sometimes that just helps your computer like orient back to the the presentation and then you might be able to advance if you click with your mouse first on the screen and then try advancing the slides. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear that. I was just saying if you click um, with your mouse on the screen and then try advancing the slides from there. Okay. Oh, there, there you go. go. You oh, got it. Right. Yeah. So, sometimes it, I, it just, yes, I, yeah. I have about a five minute shutdown. <laughs> Okay, so the presentation that Heidi and I are bringing to you today is based on information that we've drawn from Beyond Labels, which is a guide on working with abuse with survivors who have mental health disabilities. And so just a little bit of a history about why we have this uh, manual. Um, I know a significant number of people who are diagnosed with serious mental illness or substance use abuse and addiction also report a history of sexual assault, domestic violence, and other traumatic events. So many of these survivors are moving from one public mental health system and substance abuse recovery system to another um, without ever really finding help for the violence and what I believe to be, in many cases, the underlying experience of violence. So in 1996, SAFE's Disability Services staff began implementing a statewide training program in support of increasing victim service agencies, accessibility, and primarily to people with physical disabilities, sensory disabilities, and developmental disabilities. And invariably, we would get to the end of a training and everyone, at least someone, would raise a hand or, or state, you know, this is all very well and good, but what about working with survivors who drink or who use drugs or who have mental illness or we believe have mental illness? So after a couple of years of this, we began looking at the literature. We been reach, began reaching out to other crisis centers, mental health providers, coworkers across safe programs, mental health peer support specialists, abuse survivors themselves, and then people from around the country that we learned were already working 
at the intersections of violence, mental health, and substance abuse. And what we found is that most of the time, the experiences of violence were attributed to the mental illness as the underlying issue. And so we begin to gather information um, and have compiled it in the manual. And um, what we're hoping to do today is bring some of this information to you in a way that could support your work with all survivors who are asking for your services and that we can affirm the work that you're already doing. So I'm gonna turn the mic over to Heidi and she's going to introduce herself and then outline our learning objectives for this morning and get us started. Hi everyone, my name is Heidi Lursch and my pronouns are they, them. And I am the Disability Services Educator and Training Coordinator at SAFE. And before I begin, I want to be direct in that I'm, I'm just recovering from a pretty intense illness. And so my capacity is lower than it normally is. And I know a lot of our capacity, a lot of, a lot of us have a lower capacity now, um, just relative to the trauma that we've all experienced during the pandemic. So I hope that you'll take care of yourself during this presentation. So today, our learning objectives, we're going to Thanks, Shell. Um, we're gonna go over language used to discuss mental health. Um, language is really important and language has the ability to isolate and create stigma or to include. And so it's really important that we're aware of the language we use when we talk about mental health, especially when it relates to survivors of trauma. Next, we're gonna consider our understanding of trauma and the impact on the brain. Shell is gonna do a great overview of what trauma looks like and how it affects the brain and behavior and mental health. Then we're gonna ex explore the connections be between trauma, mental health symptoms, violence, and substance use. There's so much overlap, um, so many co-occurring conditions when we look at the intersections of trauma, mental health symptoms, violence, and substance use. And finally, we're going to look at how you can enhance accessibility and support services to survivors with mental health sy symptoms and substance use um, at, in your workplaces. So we'll begin by talking about language. So what is mental health? <laughs> That's a big question, right? Um, I'd like to start by reading a poem from Debbie Sasula about mental health. And Debbie says, if you're overly excited, you're happy. If I'm over, overly excited, I'm manic. If you imagine phones ringing, you're stressed out. If I imagine phones ringing, I'm psychotic. If you're crying and sleeping all day, you're sad and you need time out. If I'm crying and sleeping all day, I'm depressed and I need to get up. If you're afraid to leave your house at night, you're cautious. If I'm afraid to leave my house at night, I'm paranoid. If you speak your mind and express opinions, you're assertive. If I speak my mind and express my opinion, I'm aggressive. If you don't like something and mention it, you're being honest. If I don't like something and mention it, I'm being difficult. If you get angry, you're considered upset. If I get angry, I'm considered dangerous. If you overreact, you're sensitive. If I overreact, I'm out of control. If you don't wanna be around others, you're taking care of yourself and you're relaxing. If I don't wanna be around others, I'm isolating myself and avoiding. If you talk to strangers, you're being friendly. If I talk to strangers, I'm being inappropriate. For all of the above, you're not told to take a pill or hospitalize, but I am. And I really like this poem because it, it shifts the perspective from us being on the outside observing behavior and feeling like we're the experts on someone's mental health or what they need it shifts that perspective to that person as the expert on their own mental health and their own needs. 
And we're gonna talk a lot today about how survivors are experts, not only in their experiences of trauma and their support needs, but they are experts on their own mental health. And we need to center that in our interactions with survivors who have mental health symptoms. And so if we take that perspective of recognizing that the survivor is the expert in their own mental health, then this definition of mental health fits well. Where it says mental health and well being includes a person's own feelings that they don't show. We go back to the previous slide. Shall we go back? <laughs> All righty. Oh, can you keep going back? Go back. One more. Yeah, go back to the one more. There you go. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So this definition of mental health really centers a person's own feelings about their mental health. And it says that mental health and well being includes a person's feeling that they are coping, that they are fairly in control of their lives and that they can manage challenges and responsibilities. This definition does not include an outsider perspective saying, oh, well, your mental health is suffering, your mental health is not good. You know, I could see from your behavior that you need help. This is really centering that person's feeling of their own mental health. Okay, Sean, next slide, please. Thanks. So some other considerations when we're thinking about mental health are, is a person, being productive in their activities? Do they have fulfilling relationships with other people? And do they have the ability to adapt to change and to cope? Next slide, Shell. Thanks. So what is mental illness? And before we talk about the specifics of mental illness as categorized in diagnostic um, context, I want to start by recognizing that the word mental illness has all kinds of negative connotations. <laughs> and it's very, very tied to a strict medical perspective. When we think of illness, we likely think sick, wrong, and bad. And there's so much stigma there. And while there may be necessary reasons to use medical terms, such as diagnostic criteria that can be helpful in understanding someone's potential needs, we need to be really careful not to apply that stigma that we unconsciously associate with the word illness to the people that we are serving. A diagnosis of mental illness does not mean that someone cannot have good stable mental health or that their life is always impacted by their mental health symptoms. Mental disorders are health concerns that refer to changes in thinking, mood, or behavior and are associated with distress and or impaired, impaired functioning. Mental disorders are diagnosed by a licensed or credentialed mental health and or medical professional, including do medical doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, and clinical social workers. And the criteria for diagnosis can be found in the DSM-5. So, Heidi? Yeah. You are the only person who's unmuted and there's a lot of background shuffling or something around maybe oh. where your microphone is and it's making a lot of feedback. Oh no. Okay. Thanks for letting me know. Uh-huh. Um, so I don't know if there's something on it or something's moving. Oh, that's okay. very strange. That is really weird. I'm sorry about that, y'all. Um, let's see. I'm fine I now. It, okay. I wonder if it's, if it's my... I have my nose too close to the microphone. Thank All right, you. let me adjust. And okay. It's, it's fine now. Are we good? Okay. All right. All right. So we know that trauma has a profound impact on a survivor's sense of control, connection, and meaning. For survivors of domestic and sexual violence, the trauma that they have experienced leads to behaviors and coping skills that allow them to survive. These behaviors and coping skills might also qual qualify them for a diagnosis of a mental health disorder. For example, a survivor may disassociate in order to cope with the overwhelming feelings and memories from trauma, 
the survivor may be diagnosed with disassociative disorder and substance use disorder. And in this context, those behaviors allowed that survivor to live through the trauma. They were coping by disassociating and coping by using substances to be able to get through the incredibly painful experience of trauma. And so shifting our lens from seeing mental health disorder symptoms as dysfunctional to seeing them as adaptive qualities that allowed a person to survive brings us to a more strengths-based per perspective when we're interacting with survivors with mental health symptoms. Reframing a diagnosis as a survival coping mechanism or a consequence of trauma helps us put a survivor's experience and needs in context. Research shows that without intervention, the neurological and biological consequences of trauma include depression, suicidal tendencies, hallucinations, delusions, chronic anxiety, hostility, sleep and memory problems, and disassociation. Trauma and mental health consequences are inextricably linked. It's not our job to understand what caused this or that behavior, but it is our job to see and respond to survivors with compassion and to understand the context within which survivors come to us. And so we need to make sure that we're looking at survivors and seeing the whole picture and seeing how trauma has such a profound impact on mental health and that many mental health symptoms are actually coping mechanisms that allowed a person to survive. And in that way, they are absolutely strengths in that moment because it allowed the person to get where they are today. Next slide, please, Shell. So recovering from trauma means, for many survivors, it means abandoning what have been essential coping mechanisms. It also means taking enormous risks. Recovery is risky. If you have to abandon the coping mechanisms that allowed you to survive, there's so much risk there. It feels risky to leave behind these behaviors and coping skills. Trusting treatment providers is risky. Being vulnerable with family and friends is risky. Survivors show extreme bravery when they engage with systems to recover from violence. And we need to honor that bravery, the bravery that it takes to heal, the bravery that it takes to unlearn those coping mechanisms that allow them to survive. And one of the ways that we can honor this bravery is, be, is by being receptive and by being prepared to support survivors through expected mental health challenges. And part of that preparation means that you are doing your research, that you're learning, you're part of this webinar, so that's a great step. Um, another great step would be to access our Beyond Labels manual. Um, it's such an invaluable resource and tool to your work with survivors um, because we know that survivors of violence are so likely to have mental health disorders and to exhibit mental health symptoms. Next slide, please, Shell. So we're gonna take a quick look at statistics. And when we look at statistics, we know that mental health related disabilities are the most common disability in the United States. Nearly one in five adults in the United States live with a mental health disorder. We also know that there's a huge overlap between mental health disorders and substance use disorders. Um, among, 40, among the 42.1 million adults in the US that reported mental illness, almost 20% reported that they also have substance use disorder. We also know that there's no one size fits all approach to working with survivors with mental health symptoms. Even if you know someone's diagnosis, you don't know exactly what they need and you don't know all of what they need. So again, going back to the survivor as the expert, not only on their experience of trauma, but the expert on their own mental health disorder and the expert on their own mental health needs. 
it's so important to always survivor the, to always center the survivor as the expert. They're the experts on what they need, what their mental health feels like right now, what they might need in the future, what has contributed to their mental health. We're not the experts, but we are there to support the experts in getting what they need to heal and recover from trauma. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more about language and labels and diagnosis. So we've already talked about stigma around mental health disorders and around diagnosis. And um, unfortunately, about two thirds of Americans do not receive treatment for their mental health related symptoms. And we can tie that to the enormous cultural stigma that we have around mental health in this country. In a recent study, 42% of people with a diagn diagnosed mental health disability said they were embarrassed or ashamed of their symptoms. For survivors of sexual violence, there's already a significant cultural shame. And compounding that with cultural shame around mental health disorders can just be an enormous weight on survivors who are trying to heal from trauma. In another survey conducted by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, many people reported that they would rather tell their employer that they committed a crime and served time in jail than admit to having been in a psychiatric hospital. So that gives you an idea, an idea of the amount of shame that people feel when they receive a mental health diagnosis. One way that you can help remove the shame and the stigma for survivors with mental health disorders is to make sure that you're using language that is respectful and compassionate when you talk about mental health. When it comes to a diagnosis, you need to be aware that the individual might not identify with that diagnosis. And so you referring to that diagnosis or talking about that diagnosis often can actually break trust and make that individual feel like you're not seeing them and you are not respecting how they identify. But we know that there can be benefits to a diagnosis. We know that for most systems and mental health services, an individual needs a diagnosis to be able to access those systems and those services. So we can provide the survivor with guidance around what benefits come with a diagnosis, but also being compassionate about the fact that that diagnosis may come with an enormous amount of stigma and may also not, not um, reflect how that survivor sees themselves. It's also important to know that a diagnosis can shift the focus of the crisis. So a di too often a, um, a survivor receiving a mental health diagnosis, that shifts the focus to the mental health diagnosis and not the needs that the survivor has as a person who's healing from trauma. Those needs will remain regardless of the diagnosis. We also know that a diagnosis can follow a survivor for years and, and that shame and stigma can follow that survivor also. So we need to be really aware of that um, and really thoughtful about where we're putting that diagnosis, making sure we're getting consent from the survivor to talk about the diagnosis if it's necessary, to put the diagnosis on documentation and, and follow the survivor's lead in that aspect. Next slide, Shell. Some more things about specific mental health diagnosis. It might not be in, it might not be accurate and it might change. We've already talked about the stigma that comes along with a diagnosis for a survivor. Again, the documentation that can follow a survivor for years. And so what you can do is make sure that you are providing information to the survivor so that they understand what is likely to happen after they receive a diagnosis and how it might impact future services that they receive. 
We also know that the diagnosis can be used by a perpetrator to discredit the survivor. Um, it, can, it can be used to stop them from being employed. It can be used in custody cases with children. And we need to be really careful that we're not using a diagnosis to filter everything that we see about the survivor through. So once the survivor receives a mental health disorder diagnosis, we need to make sure that we're not applying that di diagnosis to all of their behavior. And, and because that will stop us from seeing the needs that that survivor has um, as, as someone who has experienced trauma. They need to heal from the trauma and that's separate from the mental health diagnosis. It's important that we're not pathologizing all of a survivor's behaviors as related to the mental health diagnosis. Many of their behaviors might be a response from the trauma or they have an unmet healing need that they're trying to resolve. So when a survivor comes to you and they've received a mental health diagnosis, the first and probably most important thing you can do is to talk to that person about what the diagnosis means to them. Is this a diagnosis that they identify with? If it's not a diagnosis that they identify with, then you want to make sure that as much as possible, you're not using that diagnosis to describe them or their behavior because it is not something that they identify with. You also want to make sure that you're mirroring the language the survivor uses to talk about themselves and their identity and their behavior. So you can ask the survivor how they want you to refer to the diagnosis. And if it's not relevant to the conversation, then you never need to disclose the survivor's diagnosis. That's confidential information that you should not be sharing unless they give you consent to share or reference with other staff or other professionals. And you want to use per person-first language when you're talking about mental health um, disorder diagnosis. Oh, and I see Michelle put in the chat, which is how we would mirror language around their assault or their abuser. Yeah. So you want to use person-first language, and that's where you're putting the person before the diagnosis, unless the survivor directs you to use some other, some other form of language. So you would, instead of saying the mentally ill, instead of saying, you know, the psychotic, which those are words that you would never use, <clears throat> you would say a person with a mental health diagnosis, or you would say a person with, and then their specific diagnosis. And that way you're putting the person before the diagnosis. And you always wanna be cautious with reclaimed terms. So the terms that I was just referring to, those are terms that historically have been used in um, negative ways to describe people with mental health disorder diagnoses. And sometimes individuals reclaim those terms as a way of taking, taking their power back and you're gonna respect their right to do that, but you would never use those terms to describe survivors. Shall I, shall I can't hear the sound on the video? I'm wondering if maybe that's just Hi, I didn't know you have videos. So, um, because there's some permissions we have to change. And Shell will need to share her sound in the options box. So I need to share what? Your sound. Okay. So I've unmuted myself. What else? So Shell, actually I'm thinking that the audio on this video is just music. Yes. Um, so if you, I think it would be fine to show the video, just the video without the audio. I think we can run it without the music. I agree. Okay. 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 Do you have any other videos though? We might need to. Okay, great. No.
So to wrap up our section on language around mental health disorders, um, I wanna read this quote from Teresa Soto, who is a prominent disability rights activist. And she says, your words are one of the tools at your disposal to make justice. And I would expand upon that and say, your words are one of the tools at your disposal to support healing. Um, so the language that you use is really important and you have the ability to include people and make people feel heard and seen and validated. You also have the ability to exclude people and create stigma and shame around their mental health disorders or the mental health diagnosis. So it's really important that we're aware of our language, not only when we're in front of survivors, but when we're, we are talking about survivors or talking about anyone with mental health disorders um, especially in our workplaces with other staff. So um, at one point I was working for a crisis center and there was a survivor in the shelter who had a mental health disorder and that survivor had some mental health symptoms that were pretty extreme. And I witnessed the staff in that, sh in, in that workplace talking about the survivor in ways that were really derogatory. Um, labeling that survivor as a frequent flyer, as someone who needed it to be institutionalized, as someone who need, had needs that we couldn't help them with. And all of that talk, what, what it was doing was, was ex like ignoring the survivor's need to heal from the trauma they've experienced. We have to always center those healing needs in our interactions and in our talk about survivors. When someone has a, also has a mental health diagnosis, that doesn't mean that they don't still have those needs to heal from trauma. And when we talk about people with mental health disorders in derogatory ways, we forget that they are survivors of trauma first, and that is why they have come to us. So it's really important that we don't say things um, using metaphors about mental health to describe bad situations. For example, you know, when you say like, oh, that, that's, that, that was crazy. What we're doing is we're saying that crazy is such a bad thing, being crazy, air quotes, is such a bad thing that we're going to use it to describe other bad things. You know, when we say that somebody is a nut job, when we say that somebody, um, when we say that something was insane, what we're saying is that thing is so bad, it's like someone with a mental health disorder. And I know that that kind of language is really common in our culture and our society, but it does affect our mindset. So as much as possible, we have to be aware of language and we've got to be aware of our own mindset around mental health so that we can come to our work and center the healing needs of survivors, um, regardless of diagnosis. And we can also anticipate that survivors will have mental health disorders because we know that trauma has such a profound impact on mental health for all people. All right, and I'm gonna pass it to Shell for the next section. Okay, thanks Heidi. So as, as Heidi has said, um, there's not really a crystal clear picture of what mental health disabilities are and what causes them. Some people believe that the mental health, um, mental illness uh, issues are more related to biological, primarily biological um, causality. Others believe it's a learned response to traumatic events. And then still others believe that there's kind of a, a, a very complex interplay of many factors. And so for the rest of our time with you today, Heidi and I will focus on some of these dynamics, um, some of the connections between traumatic events and mental health. And then on Friday, um, when we do the second half of this training, we'll focus on the interplay of violence, trauma, and substance use and abuse. So what is trauma? You know, trauma is what happens to a person when their mind and their body experience danger, a situation where life is threatened or there's a threat to the physical integrity of their own or someone else's body. Now, physical integrity is defined as the person's right 
to decide what happens to their own bodies or a person's right to self-determination. A traumatic event could be witnessing or experiencing sexual assault, domestic violence, care provider abuse, living through a disaster, uh, or being witness to a random violence. And I can't help but think about trauma when I look at the past 18 months of our lives and when I turn on the TV at night. We are, it feels like we have been immersed in experiencing traumatic events across the past, specifically the past 18 months. And so this ends up becoming very real to me and I notice in my own self, some of my own reactions to what we've been experiencing, the impact of trauma. So when there is a threat or dangers perceived, the person's instinctive defensive responses within the nervous system are activated within nanoseconds of the perception of danger. And I looked up nanoseconds and it's one billionth of a second. So we respond to um, indicators of danger very, very quickly. And sometimes a person can mobilize those protective responses or the defensive responses. But at other times, a person's nervous system is overwhelmed and they experience the intense terror, the helplessness, the hopelessness, and then a loss of control. Peter Levine wrote, in an unspoken voice, how the body releases trauma and restores goodness, he wrote that the, tra the trauma is not actually the event or actually what happened, but instead it's what we hold inside about what happened or what happens to us or we believe will happen to us. In other words, the trauma occurs when we experience danger without the possibility of defending ourselves. And then after the danger is passed, we don't have an opportunity to resolve that defensive response or we can't shake it off. We can't release the traumatic stress or our nervous system cannot settle down. When that happens, we can experience a physical and emotional shutdown and a sense of helplessness in the face of danger. So traumatic experiences will, um, in summary, make us feel helpless threatens our boundaries or our usual coping strategies. They just don't work. And it overwhelms our capacity to have a sense of control over ourselves and our immediate environment. It impacts our ability to maintain connections with other people and then to make meaning of the experiences. A traumatic event could be natural disasters. It could be war, combatants and civilians could be related to terrorism, sexual assault, childhood abuse, witnessing a crime, being imprisoned, car accidents, or acquiring a disability. And it's also important for us to recognize that not only can traumatic events impact us deeply, and sometimes for a very long time, some people who experience a traumatic event are not impacted in ways that are traumatizing or they do not experience traumatic stress symptoms. So the trauma response is very complex and some of the things that will determine the impact of a person's response to an event is the resilience of the person, the hardiness of the individual's nervous system, the personal traits that they have, and then their experiences prior to the trauma. And so, you know, what does this mean for us in our work? It means that we can't assume that a person is going to be traumatized or develop symptoms of traumatic stress or post-traumatic stress. So it's really important that when we're working with our survivors, that we invite the survivor of trauma to tell us how the experience impacted them, how big it was to them, rather than assuming so trauma, I'm gonna talk next about um, trauma in the brain. If we're stuck in a past survival mode, it makes it really difficult for us to feel safe and to focus in the present time. Situations or events that would typically just be irritating or intrusive or maybe just a challenge to deal with can result in overwhelming feelings of threat and dread. 
And this disruption in the nervous system can create a lot of symptoms that go back to some of the things that Heidi was talking about. It can create hyperarousal, dissociation, self-blame, hopelessness, helplessness, depression, hallucinations, delusion, and other impacts. So I want to talk for just a little bit about the flight, fight, flight, or freeze um, response to trauma. I, although what I'm going to talk about is extremely simplified because the body's interaction with trauma is, is um, very complicated, but it's been very helpful to me to understand by having some understanding of trauma and the neurobiology of trauma, how it is that some interventions we find to be very useful or helpful and why some of our interventions are actually harmful or re-traumatizing to survivors of family violence and sexual assault. So if you'll humor me, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of our neurochemicals and uh, the impact on our perception and our behavior and our ability to function. So when a person first perceives danger, our most immediate response is to look for help and protection from other people. We're social beings. We depend on our families. We depend on our friends, a helpful bystander, our people for support or help when we're afraid or we are um, in danger of some sort or believe we're in danger. But if those supports and resources are not available, then we do our best to fight against the danger or to get away or we freeze. What activates our body's protective response, which is also survival driven, is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. I just refer to this as the HPA system. This is where our body's central nervous system and our endocrine system work together to release the neurotransmitters and the hormones that we need to be prepared to defend ourselves against the danger or the threat of danger. But if this stress response is too severe or too long or is activated too often, then the chemicals that are released by the HPA axis can damage and reduce a survivor's functioning. So I want to mention a few of the neurochemicals because they're directly related to the physical and the emotional impacts of trauma. And the first is the catecholamines. I won't try to spell that, but these are neurotransmitters like epinephrine, norepinephrine, and if they are overused, they can become chronically elevated. Now, if this happens, hypervigilance is increased, memory can be damaged, and it makes rational thought very difficult. And it can make it difficult to distinguish typical danger signals that are in our environment. The catecholamines can impair rational thought and memory for up to four days following a traumatic event or an assault. And that means that for a period of time, decision-making can be severely compromised. It impacts the ability to retrieve memories the person overall just does not think very well. And yet this is often the same period of time when a trauma survivor is expected to answer questions, provide a timeline for events as part of evidence collection, or maybe complete intake forms or give enough information during a hotline call for workers to make decisions about shelter access or other services. The second neurochemical that I wanna mention are the corticosteroids. So one example of a corticosteroid is cortisol. These are also, excuse me, involved in the body's protective response. These steroids can serve, uh, these, these steroids control energy and immune system functioning, and they also help us conserve energy and play a big part in the freeze response or tonic immobility. When a danger is uncontrollable, and in the most extreme and fearful situations, freeze is our autonomic response to that fear. And if it's triggered too often, 
the corticosteroids will reduce our immune functioning and our energy. So behaviorally, this might look like the survivor that's barely able to get out of bed in the morning. They miss appointments, they're depressed. They just don't seem to have much motivation to um, work on their plans. The third chemical I wanna mention are the opioids. This is the chemical that reduces pain and is also very high in cases of physical or sexual trauma. It's helpful in preventing and reducing pain, but it also inhibits memory in cases of severe victimization. So what may not be helpful during the investigation is that these chemicals can cause a very flat affect or very expressionless affect and expression. So it's important to know this because the impact of a sexual assault or an act of violence um, or long-term sexual abuse can't be judged by a person's emotional reactivity. It's reasonable for us to expect that many trauma survivors are not going to show much expression or much emotion following traumatic events. And then oxytocin. This is a hormone that's released during the human stress response. Oxytocin is very helpful in promoting good feelings. It's considered the love chemical. It plays a big role in the neuroanatomy of intimacy and bonding between a mother and a child. But what's not helpful is that this can impair memory and it can create bonding between a survivor and the person that's responsible for their trauma or the violence. So some of the other neurotransmitters that are involved in traumatic stress and danger reactions include serotonin. When this is overused, it can lead to depression and problems with self-regulation or anger control. Dopamine, when this is overused, it can decrease alertness and motivation. And then I'll mention one other chemical, which is GABA or gamma, amino, uh, GABA aminobutyric acid. This is the neurochemical that provides a break to our neurotransmitters. It calms, it regulates sedative actions in the brain, and it's critical for us to be able to relax. When we understand its role in chronic stress, it makes a lot of sense, it makes a whole lot more sense to me how trauma survivors can find it so difficult to experience just a calm, relaxed, hanging out kind of a space. So what can this stress response look like behaviorally or practically speaking? What can fight or flight look like? It can look like oppositional defiant behavior. It can look like engaging in power struggles, aggressive behavior, angry explosive outbursts, hyperactivity, obsessive compulsive behavior, restlessness, being overly talkative, leaving, running away, dissociation, these are some of the behaviors that sometimes are clinically referred to as explosive. The person has difficulty self-regulating, they're acting out, they're attention seeking, they're manipulative, they're manic, they're, dram they're dramatic or drama queens or kings, they are paranoid or other labels that can be really damaging and mischaracterizes what that survivor's experience can be. And then freeze, what can freeze look like? Look like daydreaming, having difficulty paying attention, being really disorganized, not completing assignments, headaches, stomach aches, low energy, flat affect, isolating, withdrawing, having too few or no friends, being extremely sensitive to noise, and then alcohol and drug use and abuse. What's interesting to me in my study of freeze, I learned that freeze is thought to be the most fearful threat, the response to the most fearful threats. And at the same time, it seems to be the most hopeful. A survivor freezes in the hope that they will survive to be able to fight on another day. So when the safety needs are not met, people are most likely to be willing to tolerate additional harm. They're more likely to be involved in harmful acts because they're familiar, they're more likely to use substances to alleviate pain, and they're more likely to seek out acceptance from other people, even if it's at their own expense. Okay, so I need to take a break. We're gonna switch and talk a little bit about trauma, mental health, and violence.
um, in particular, but let me take a sip of water. Okay, so as I've been, as Heidi and I were preparing and I've been thinking through what, what I wanted to share, um, I kept noticing the really strong relationship in this information or the co-relationship between past violence, the subsequent trauma, the impact of that trauma on mental health, and then the ways that mental health impact their risks for future violence and for additional trauma. And so my, my question is this, when and how does a person find their way out of this conundrum or this loop and gain access to the interventions and the healing services and the connections with safe others. To me, that's our, that's our task. How do we support survivors with mental health related disabilities to find a path out of that cycle? The relationships are very clear, whether it's the chicken or the egg that creates symptoms of mental illness, um, doesn't matter which comes first, people, can still end up being, I would say, maybe trapped in that cycle. And I see part of our mission is to find ways to help a person step out of that and begin to move forward, forward and um, with their healing and with their recovery from trauma. So numerous studies have documented the ways in which unaddressed childhood trauma does impact our adult lives. One of the most notable bodies of research was summarized in the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, the ACE study. These findings actually are landmark and are critically important no matter what our professions are, no matter what our involvement is with children and adults in our different professions. What we have through this study is irrefutable evidence of the impact throughout adulthood of what happens in childhood. The adverse experiences do include sexual and physical and emotional abuse, domestic violence, having a substance abusing parent, a family member chronically depressed or emotionally disturbed or suicidal, and then the death or abandonment of a parent. And I think when I think about this, it's these are places where we can strive to provide interventions because these are also some of the experiences that contribute to that intergenerational trauma, intergenerational violence that we that we see, that we experience, that we would like to see broken. We'd like to see those chains broken. So the effects of trauma on mental health. They can lead to hallucinations, delusions, depression, suicidal tendencies, chronic anxiety, hostility, flashbacks, sleep problems, impaired memory, and dissociation. So what I want to talk through next are the results of a couple of studies on adult diagnoses with mental health and their experiences of abuse and the impact on their experiences of abuse. So in as back as far as like 1989, in one study of 54 women that were diagnosed with schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and co-occurring substance abuse or dependence, 61% of that group had experienced childhood sexual abuse. 48% reported childhood physical abuse 59% reported adult sexual abuse, and 82% reported adult physical abuse. 81% of the adults diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and 90% diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder were sexually or physically abused as children. And then victimization. Among a group of 936 people in Chicago that were diagnosed with co-occurring severe mental illness and substance abuse or addiction, 25% reported that they were victims of crime in the course of a year. 
at least eight times were more likely to be robbed. They were 15 times more likely to be assaulted and 23 times more likely to have been raped. So why are the risks of abuse so very high among trauma survivors that are living with symptoms of mental health disabilities? Their abuser may threaten hospitalization and most people diagnosed with serious mental illness or chronic mental illness have had those experiences of being hospitalized um, with or without their consent. So that's a huge threat, can be a huge threat. Symptoms can interfere with, interfere with judgment, with their decision-making, with their cognitive functioning. The person may have learned not to trust their instinct. They may have less effective coping methods like substance use or addiction. They may have already burned out their family and their friends' networks, and they may have burned bridges with professional helpers. So some of the increases in risk for victimization are also, um, or getting justice for their victimization is that they're very unlikely to be viewed as by professional helpers as credible. Their perpetrators do perceive that they're easier targets with their social isolation, social, social isolation and segregation, routine boundary violations, societal stigma, and then over medication that can be used as a coping control device. And so what are some of the barriers real very quickly at getting the supports that they need? I don't know about where you are, but in our community, our public mental health systems are underfunded. We lack available and affordable health insurance coverage for mental health services. People are often choosing to pay for food, housing, childcare, and other necessities of life rather than purchasing, being able to purchase insurance. There's a varying availability of treatments based on where a person lives, especially in the more rural areas of Texas. Um, there's very few treatment options available. And then lack of training on addressing core issues of trauma that's associated with violence. And then restrictions on medications and the relative lack of long-term therapeutic services. Unless in our city, unless you have independent means or re a lot of resources, it's very, very difficult to find a therapist that will work with you long-term if you have serious impacts of lifetime of trauma. So this is also um, a huge barrier for survivors getting the supports that they need. Erin Goodison, who is our Senior Director of Housing at SAFE, shared with me one time that she would predict that any one time at least 50% of our residents are experiencing or struggling with issues that are related to their mental health or to substance use. But then she followed that up by saying, so we're only going to deepen the stigma when we don't choose to deal and work with the survivor because they have other issues like mental health related symptoms or substance abuse in their lives. So with that quote and that thought in mind, we're gonna transition and Heidi's gonna talk with us about some of the trauma informed supports for survivors who do report or who are struggling with mental health and substance use issues. So Heidi, I'm gonna turn this back over to you and check in with time. You have about, we have about 20, 25 minutes. All right, thanks, John. All right, y'all, so now we're gonna to move to looking at how you can make your supports and services more trauma-informed, especially for survivors with mental health disorders. So a trauma-informed care and trauma-informed care approach means that we're shifting our thinking from what is wrong with you, or I would say, what is your diagnosis, to what happened to you and how did you survive? What 
coping mechanisms did you develop to survive? So again, shifting our thinking from seeing behaviors as strictly dysfunctional symptoms of mental health disorders to incredible coping mechanisms that have in many cases allowed survivors to survive. So I'm gonna review the trauma-informed values because this is really the foundation of making sure that you're providing trauma-informed care. So we always start with safety, um, making sure that you are creating a safe place physically and emotionally for the survivor. So that means that making sure that you're using language that validates the survivor that is in line with how they see themselves, their experience and their diagnosis if they have one making sure that the space that the survivor is in makes them feel physically safe. And I'll talk in a moment about some intake questions that you can use to help make sure you're meeting those physical safety needs that the survivor has. The next value is trust, trustworthiness. Can I believe in you to tell me the truth and be honest? So you need to make sure that you are presenting information to the survivor that is accurate and you're talking with the survivor about what is likely to happen. You're being direct, honest, and clear with the survivor about expectations, about boundaries, and about what the healing process is likely to look for them. Um, if they're going to interact with other systems, then you're helping prepare them for that. Those things are gonna build trust, as well as, again, using that language that validates um, their identity and their experience and their diagnosis, if they have a diagnosis and how they relate to that diagnosis. The next value is choice. So you wanna make sure that you're providing real authentic choices and returning the power to the survivor. And that means that you are respecting that survivor's right to choose whether or not they're seeking mental health services whether or not they're pursuing a diagnosis, whether or not um, the treatment prescribed to them is a good fit for them. You're supporting their choices in those really important key areas and empowering them to um, take back the power and control that they have lost in the experience of trauma. The next trauma-informed value is collaboration. So you're working with the survivor. You're not on the outside dictating to them, hey, I think that you have a mental health disorder. I can see from your behavior you need help. You're remembering that the survivor is the expert and your job is to come to the table and work with the survivor and not be on the outside telling them what they need to do. And I mean, I think this is basic in our work. And the final trauma-informed value is empowerment. So you're empowering the survivor to, to speak up with their needs, to let us know what it is they need, whether it's related to their experience of trauma or whether it's related to their mental health. That survivor is the expert and we can only help them get their needs met if they feel empowered to tell us what those needs are. Next slide, Shell. Thanks. So some really key reminders some trauma-informed reminders when you're providing services for survivors with mental health disorders. Um, so again, it's so important to not see behavior as strictly a dysfunctional symptom of a mental health disorder, but to reframe that behavior as a coping response. And that behavior was quite possibly at one point a strength that allowed the survivor to get to where they are today. And when we reframe how we look at behavior, that helps us improve our interactions with survivors with mental health disorders. You're offering, you're, um, offering collaboration and partnerships around the various issues and needs, and you're providing those real choices. So, you know, offering options instead of dictating, instead of saying like, you need to seek mental health services checking in with the survivor. How are you feeling? How do you feel like your mental health is right now? You know, what do you think your mental, what are your mental health needs? You tell me, and let's think about some options and support them in whatever avenue they decide to go, remembering that the survivor is the expert. And finally, 
it's so important to remember that all behavior is communication. And so you can be um, really instrumental in observing behavior and checking in with the survivor and saying, like, hey, I noticed this has changed. You know, is that significant or, or, or not? And the survivor will tell us the survivor is the expert. Um, behavior changes might indicate that the survivor is moving from, from one coping mechanism to another, then it might indicate that the survivor has new needs that need to be met. So checking in about behavior. Accommodation. So I'm not gonna get into the weeds about accommodations right now. If you have specific questions about accommodations, please reach out to us through email on those, but just in, just keeping an eye on time, when you come to this work, um, you should come with the mindset that you are going to do whatever it takes to help the survivor get their needs met and to heal from trauma. Often that means asking the survivor about how you can accommodate them. And that can be something really simple, like, would you like the lights dim? You know, um, do you learn best when, when there are picture supports involved? You know, um, checking for understanding, or it could be a more formal accommodation where you're making sure that the survivor has a translator, um, that the materials provided are in plain language and accessible to the survivor. Next slide, Shell. So after a person's eligibility for services has been established, then you can ask the survivor, how you can best support them, remembering that the survivor is the expert on what accommodations they need. Some things that you can say during the intake process are, if you discover that you need anything while you're receiving services, please let us know. And you can continue to check in with that person. Is there anything else? Is there anything additional um, that would help you as you're receiving our services? It's not just a one-time thing. Hey, do you need anything? You're good. Okay. We won't check in again, but you're continually, continually checking in with that person to see what accommodations you can provide to make your services more accessible to them. You can also say, do you know of any needs you have that we can help you with while you're here? And then you can give some examples. For many survivors who are possibly still in a trauma mindset, it can be really helpful if you provide examples and then they can choose an option from those examples that um, helps them get their needs met instead of asking them a really open-ended question. Some examples um, of those options are, you can say, I can provide you with information on how the building's laid out so that you know where the exits are, so that you know where the restrooms are, so that you know where you are in relation to everyone else. Um, have, you, have you attended a support or advocacy group in the past? Is that something that you're interested in? How did that go when you did, if you did attend a support or advocacy group? Um, you can talk with the survivor about whether or not they have medication, where to store that medication, whether or not they have a physician to refill that medication, whether or not that medication is helpful to them. And then you can do some advanced planning um, with the survivor. So you can create a psychiatric advance directive that gives you and other staff instructions that the survivor has laid out on what to do if at some point they do not have the capacity to receive treatment. This can be really helpful and you can add, put medic what to do with medications in there, um, who to contact, and it can help the survivor have a sense of control if for some reason they're not able to make choices in the moment. So we, so I think that probably everyone knows that mental health disorders are absolutely covered under the AD, the ADA, <laughs> ADD, that's me. Um, <laughs> the Americans with Disabilities Act. And um, the only thing I'm gonna say about that now is just that, you know, it's your job to make sure that your services are accessible. Not only is it the law, but you should come to this work with that mindset that you're going to do what it takes to make your services accessible to all the survivors who come seeking healing. So looking at the intake, making your intake more trauma-informed, some things that you, questions that you might want to add 
at some point in the intake process. Um, asking the survivor if they have experienced barriers to services in the past. This can help you understand, one, if a survivor has fears um, or hesitations about seeking additional services, and it can help you support the survivor in making sure that those barriers do not impact um, their current services. And checking in with about specific fears around using your services can help you support the survivor through any anxiety they may have um, around receiving your services. And just kind of just validating and acknowledging that fear and anxiety can really help a survivor be more comfortable as they receive services. You can ask the survivor how they have coped, what coping mechanisms have helped in the past. That can be helpful as you're providing services. You can refer back to that. Um, if issues or challenges arise, um, you can ask the survivor if they want to use those, you know, if those coping mechanisms supported them in the past, are they going to help now? Who is in the survivor support network? So you can ask them if someone has supported them in the past and if that person is someone that they can get in touch with now, do they have that person's phone number? Would it be helpful for them to call that person if they um, are having challenges as they're receiving services? So just broadening their um, support network as they're receiving services and make sure that they have access to contact those support people. Are there other helpful resources that they've asked that, that they have um, access in the past that you can make sure that they continue to have access to as they receive your services? Um, and then finally, asking specific questions around the survivor's need for autonomy and privacy. So asking them if they are sensitive to a lot of noises, if being in groups makes them anxious, um, if they really need a lot of private time to process. <clears throat> These questions can help you make sure that the physical space you're providing a survivor makes them feel safe. Because we know that if people don't feel safe, even if they're receiving services, then they're not gonna be able to recover from trauma. So if a survivor has disclosed a diagnosis or they have disclosed that they're having mental health health symptoms, the person is probably not asking you to fix everything. But there are some things that you can do in that moment to provide direct support to the survivor. If they want, so first of all, you can want, you can ask them if they want to talk about it, if they want to continue that conversation and then respect their answer. Of course, you know, all of your care should be all of the care that you provide should be based on consent. So if someone does not want to talk about a mental health diagnosis that they've received, even if you feel like it's gonna impact services, you need to respect their decision and return that power to the survivor. If they do wanna talk about it, you wanna make sure that you're not overwhelming them with questions. But some questions that you might consider asking are, what does this diagnosis mean to you? Do you identify with this diagnosis? What's hard for you right now? You know, what's coming up for you right in this moment that I can support you with right now? And that might be fear and anxiety about the diagnosis. That might be fear and anxiety around treatment. That might be feelings of, of shame around the diagnosis or confusion about the diagnosis. And so there might be things that you can do right in that moment to provide some support to that survivor. You can ask who gave them the diagnosis. Um, where they received it, what their relationship was to the physician or to the treatment center where they received the diagnosis. Have they ever received treatment in the past? And you can ask them if, that treat if they felt like that treatment was helpful and if they feel like that treatment would be helpful again to them. Just kind of gauging where they are and how they are identifying with that diagnosis and future treatment options so that you know how to best support them in the future. And of course, is there anything that you can do to support them right now, right now in this moment? And that might not be related to their diagnosis. You know, maybe, maybe they need a distraction or they would like some, uh, to do a grounding exercise because the diagnosis is so overwhelming. 
Um, and finally, asking them if they've participated in support groups in the past, um, if those support groups have been helpful, if they're familiar with peer support groups. Peer support groups can be a really great option for survivors with mental health disorders. Um, in peer support groups, power is shared. No one is dictating what anyone should do, but they're sharing experiences that can be a really validating and supportive environment for some survivors. So if the survivor is open, you can provide information about support groups. Some things to remember, some basic things to remember when you're communicating with survivors with mental health disorders is you always want to maintain trust and do what you can to build that trust to keep your word give clear, honest, and direct information. Pay attention to your own body language. This is so important with all survivors, but we know between 70 and 90% of communication is nonverbal. So what you're doing with your body and your face impacts how survivors feel when they're with you, um, especially survivors who have mental health disorders and might be distracted by your body language or your facial expressions if they don't feel like it lines up with what you're saying. That can also be a way that um, survivors feel like trust is broken. If they feel like the, your body language and your facial expressions are not aligning with what you're telling them, they might not trust you. So be really cognizant of how you're presenting to survivors. Um, anticipate that your offers of support may be met with suspicion. And this suspicion um, which might be perceived by you as paranoia, might actually be, again, a coping mechanism that the survivor has developed in order to survive. So it might have served that survivor in the past to be really suspicious and weary of people who might do them harm. So they may come to you in that state. Not only is that understandable, but that may have been a strength in the past for them. So don't get frustrated. <laughs> Allow them to have those feelings and just work on maintaining that trust. Um, whispering, laughing with other staff, talking on the telephone, and text messaging might create fear for the survivor around what is happening. They might wonder what you're doing, what you're saying to other people, what you're texting on your phone. Um, those, all of those behaviors can increase the survivor's sense of fear um, and anxiety in the interaction with you. And, and that can, again, break that trust that you're trying to establish with the survivor. Expect, expecting a person to follow guidelines and boundaries is showing that person respect, but it's really important that you are very clear and compassionate when you set boundaries and guidelines. Make sure that the survivor understands exactly what the boundaries are and what the guidelines are. Um, one great way to do this is ask them to, to um, rephrase back to you what you've said to them. Check for that understanding. Make sure that they know what boundaries you've set and what expectations are as they're receiving services. Some other things to keep in mind, be mindful of room arrangement. Again, it's so important that survivors feel safe physically. So for many survivors and for some survivors with mental health disorders, they might feel safer sitting next to an exit, sitting closer to a door, making sure that there are not obstacles or chairs or tables in the way of their access to that exit so that if they get overwhelmed, they know that they have a way to leave the situation. A lack of response is not necessarily disrespect. So someone might not respond to you for so many reasons, um, including trauma responses, including having, experiencing mental health systems, dissociating in the moment. Um, so again, allow that person to kind of process what you're saying in the, as, as, as the best they can and not, not expecting that everything you say to them, they're gonna immediately latch on to and be so excited about because they're still recovering from trauma. Um, if the victim seems agitated or is talking nonstop, some things that you can do are gently interrupt with a simple question. You can ask, hey, do you, would you like a glass of water? Can I get you some water? Do you want to take a break? Um, that, that can be a way to gently redirect the conversation. You can shift to a safer topic. Um, even just asking, hey, is there, is there something that I can do to support you right now in this moment? You know, would you like to do a grounding exercise? Again, 
simple, simple um, questions that can help that person sort of refocus on the conversation. And then always allowing the person to take as much time as they need, offering them a quiet space. You know, hey, if while we're talking, you want to take a break, here's where you can do it. Here's when you can have some quiet downtime and we can revisit this conversation when you're ready. Okay, Shell, next slide. Some additional neurobiological interventions that can be helpful for survivors with mental health disorders include introducing the person to new environments and new experiences in a supported and safe way. So that might mean supporting them as they are entering a new support group or supporting them in engaging in a community activity that's new for them. Um, those new safe experiences are going to help them regain a sense of control over their lives and over their choices. Provide opportunity for real sharing of control. So always, again, always remembering that the survivor is the expert in their experience and in, in their needs. So always working with them, always, always deferring to where they're at with something, how they're feeling, how they feel about their mental health, how they feel about the next steps um, in their recovery. Comfort and orienting to present with animals and pets. So this can be really healing for many survivors. Um, and you can look at your policy in your agency around having support animals or around having pets in general. Um, you can also support a survivor in um, interactions with animals outside of the agency in the community, whether that's at a local animal shelter or um, a horse therapy center. Prevent sensory overload. So just making sure that you're always aware of, of the physical space that the survivor is in um, and what might trigger sensory overload for them. That might be intense sights, sounds, or bodily sensations. Um, so you can ask that person, you know, hey, where do you feel most comfortable with bright lights or with dim lights? And that's going to help you understand that person's reaction in different physical situations. You know, do you feel most comfortable when you're alone and it's quiet or when there's a lot happening? Um, those can help inform your support of that person throughout their healing. And again, you know, just developing that trust and um, continuing to build that trust with the survivor being really clear and direct and honest with the survivor at every point um, in their recovery process, whether you're talking with them about the experience of trauma that they've had or whether you're talking about them with them about their mental health. Creative expression can be a really amazing neurobiological intervention. Um, that could be dancing, music, drawing, yoga, but remembering that you can provide options to survivors. It's not your place to dictate what you think would help the survivor, um, but to, again, refer to them as the expert and say, hey, here's some options. You know, what sounds a good fit to you or maybe none of these two, and then looking at other interventions. Physical exercise for some people can be a really great neurobiological intervention, um, but never dictating that, always um, recognizing the survivor as the expert, as, as well as relaxation, mindfulness, and grounding exercises for some people, those are really healing. For other people, those are not meaningful. And so, you know, you always want to check in with the survivor instead of saying, I'd love to do a grounding exercise with you right now. Okay, let's go ahead and do it. You need to ask them first, hey, would it be helpful if we did a grounding exercise? Is there something else that would be helpful right now in this moment? Um, supporting the survivor and being aware of their sleep, their diet, and their hydration um, can be helpful in just helping them, you know, regulate and understand what's going on with their body. Dictating that they have to get seven to eight hours of sleep is not helpful, but helping them develop a sense of awareness so that they can have more, a uh, bigger sense of control over that regulation and, and those functions. And then the same with meditation and yoga, helpful for some, 
um, survivors, some survivors that would not be meaningful to them. So as much as you can get to know the survivor and and again, centering them as the expert in, in all of your interactions and in all of the supports that you're offering them. So we've got some resources here. Um, Mental Health America, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, National Institute of Mental Health and Disability Rights, Texas. So the last one is specific to Texas, of course, um, but they still might be able to provide some guidance as far as the rights of um, survivors with mental health disorders. Disability Rights Washington, excellent. All right, y'all, so part two is coming up and we're gonna focus on substance use in part two and the overlap of trauma, mental health disorders and substance use in our next, in the next part of the webinar. Mm -hmm. Which will be May 21st. Um, thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Shell. Um, uh, we will see you all back here. Um, the login and everything is the same. Uh, if you registered for this, you are automatically registered for the second half, uh, which is going to focus more on chemical dependency. Um, and that will be Friday, the 21st, same time, 10 to 1130. Thank you so much. Um, and if you have any questions that didn't get um, answer today, you can bring them also on Friday, or you can email me, michelle at wixap.org, and I'll make sure that they get them, or you can use their um, contact information right there on your screen. <laughs>